Three centuries after their creation, the famous violins of Antonio Stradivari are in great demand and sell for as much as fine works of art. The most renowned musicians dream of playing a Stradivarius. These violins have become veritable legends, so much so that today we can no longer tell what they are really worth. Has their quality been proven beyond a doubt, or are they overestimated? Are these instruments really so precious? Is their sound really unique? Today, acousticians, chemists, violin makers and musicians are trying to answer these questions. In laboratories, workshops, concert halls, they are trying to understand just what makes this mythical instrument unique and to pierce its mystery. Lot 48, at one million dollars, one million dollars. A Stradivarius used to be simply a musical instrument. In the 1980s they became investments. Today, only banks and very wealthy collectors can afford to own one. And the prices are skyrocketing. One million one hundred thousand, one million two hundred thousand. One million two hundred thousand dollars. So. How much is a Stradivarius worth? Well, I wouldn't use the term bottom of the line, but let's say they run between one million three and one million five hundred thousand euros. Then the renowned Stradivarius violins cost about twice that, around two million five, two million six hundred thousand euros. But lastly, you have a very small selection of instruments that belong to the star soloists. The violins of Menuhin and Oistrak, and you could say that violins like those are priceless. A priori, aucun prix. Out of the 1,000 violins that Antonio Stradivari made, there are 500 still in circulation. This Stradivarius dates from 1704. Like so many others, it has a special story. It had been forgotten in an attic and was rediscovered by a family in the early 20th century. From there it was sent to London, where an expert authenticated it and christened it the Sleeping Beauty. At present, it belongs to the Elbank Baden of Württemberg, who bought it for Isabel Faust. I discovered this violin thanks to a friend, who saw it on sale in Munich. He told me, you should go see it. It's the ideal violin for you. I played it for ten minutes, and those few notes just bowled me over. There were notes, excuse me if it sounds a bit kitsch, but there were notes like I had never heard before. For a musician, the artistic value of these instruments is huge. I don't know a single violinist who's not convinced that a Stradivarius is pure happiness. Like Isabel Faust, the greatest violinists consider that the Stradivarius violins have an exceptional quality. They praise the rich sound, their clarity, and their force. In this chorus of praise, it is sometimes difficult to tell whether the qualities of this violin have an objective, measurable basis.
Germany, a violin maker and physicist, Martin Schleske, has developed a certain number of computer tools capable of measuring the physical characteristics of a musical instrument. When a musician entrusts me with a violin that has a very good sound, or when people tell me, what a wonderful timbre, it's a very precious Stradivarius, and I think the same thing, I wonder why. Where does this timbre come from? And thanks to this analysis, I can say that yes, it resonates in a particular way. For each violin, Martin Schleske measured the resonance of the body at 600 different points. Then, using a graphic analysis program, he created a visual model of the oscillations that shows the deformations of the top and bottom plates of the violin, that is to say, the upper and lower parts. You can see very clearly which parts of the body vibrate with a large amplitude and which with a small, where you have oscillations in the same direction, where they are in the opposite direction, and how the top and bottom plate work together. That's the mechanism that produces the sound. This analysis shows, and it's really quite surprising, that each violin has its own personality. I've analyzed three excellent Stradivarius violins from the violin maker's golden age. The characteristic of a Stradivarius is that the energy is concentrated in the central zone, and that's what gives such a round, harmonious sound. With Garneri, on the other hand, the energy is all in the upper part and the lower part. It's very warm in the low notes, very brilliant and aggressive in the high notes. With the Stradivarius, all the energy is situated harmoniously in the middle. Scientists may have succeeded in showing that the Stradivarius resonates differently than other violins, but they still don't know exactly why. The violin, a complex object made up of more than 80 pieces, doesn't give away its secrets easily. For two centuries, people have been wondering about the uniqueness of these instruments. They have measured, weighed, and observed them from all angles, in vain. Is it now possible for us to pierce the mystery of the Stradivarius? Where will we find the answers to questions that musicians and violin makers have been asking for so many years? Should we go to Cremona, to the town where Stradivari lived and where it all started? Should we believe those who say that Stradivari was inspired by the forms of the pediment of the cathedral where he designed the F-holes of his violins? Or should we enter the Palazzo Comunale and visit the Sala dei Violini where one of the finest Stradivarius, the Cremonese, is on display? Perhaps we need to go to the town museum and examine the only painting featuring the craftsman to seek out a clue that will point us in the right direction. The painting in the Museum of Cremona shows the work in progress, the research of the craftsman who throughout his life never ceased to experiment and innovate, adding and subtracting a few millimeters to the dimensions of the instruments. Stradivarius is there, in the center of the painting, holding a flask of varnish in his right hand, as if he were wondering... For many, his secret is there in those few milliliters of the precious protective mixture. The town where Antonio Stradivari lived, more than 300 years ago, has not forgotten its past. There are still 150 violin makers following in the footsteps of their illustrious predecessor. Varnish is the thing that fascinates violin makers. They go wild over it. They say that Stradivari used an oil-based varnish. They've tried to duplicate it, but it's not easy. The main colorants are sandarac, matter root, pigments, different types of yellow, among which curcuma and cambogia. 
Of course, it's very difficult to find out exactly what Stradivari used to make his varnish. They've analyzed it, but of course, we haven't come up with his recipe. The Music Museum in Paris has five Stradivarius violins. Stefan Weidelich, the head of the museum's laboratory, has given us permission to film the fluoroscope examination of the Davidoff, a Stradivarius named after the famous general to whom it once belonged. With this examination, one can determine the chemical elements that compose the surface of the violin and thus its varnish. Here we can see the elements of calcium and potassium, which are in fact the wood that appears underneath. Then we can see iron, the zinc, probably copper, and then more specifically, here in this area, we can see lead. And this lead is present just about everywhere on the surface we've examined. The examination has revealed the presence of metallic elements over the whole surface of the top plate. Could this be the explanation? Could the presence of copper and zinc possibly explain why a Stradivarius sounds better or worse than other violins? I'm not about to venture an answer to that question. What's more, the examination of the Davidoff under ultraviolet light revealed other surprises. Certain zones of the instrument are no longer protected by the original varnish. The eight or ten layers of Antonio Stradivari's varnish are either quite worn or even completely gone from certain zones of the instruments. Most of the violins are either in this condition or have been recently re-varnished, so we can't establish any cause and effect between the fine layer that covers the instruments and their tone quality. The first X-ray analyses of the Stradivarius violins were eagerly awaited. Unfortunately, the examination that revealed the architecture of the instruments also brought to light the transformation that they had undergone down through the centuries. Indeed, most of these violins have been modified to meet the musical demands of the period. Their neck, the chords, and some of their main pieces had been replaced. Often, the only piece of the Stradivarius original work remaining is the body itself. Other scientists have suggested that the acoustic quality of the Stradivarius comes from the characteristics of the wood that the violin maker selected. Some claim that the wood should be cut at the full moon. So, along with the serious theories, we also get the most far-fetched. Between folklore, science and poetry, the mystery deepens. During his long life, Stradivari tested different types of wood. He made many forms. He experimented with a lot of different materials. The trees of the Alpine Arch and the Turbisiano region are all very good quality. We think they're certainly of a quality comparable to those used by Stradivari. Today's violin makers like Stradivari use spruce and maple to make the top and bottom plates of the violin. Taking a preliminary core sample allows one to see how the tree has grown and if it's suitable for a musical instrument. Observing the growth rings of the tree gives an idea of the mechanical qualities of the wood. 
più adatti per The slopes exposed to the north are the most favorable for growing these trees. Si è visto dall'esperienza che gli alberi We've seen through experience that the trees more exposed to the sun are flawed by blisters of resin and internal blemishes. Nel legno e un'altra cosa è la litologia del terreno. Another important criterion for selecting trees is the quality of the soil. You have to look for arid terrain with not much water because on these terrains the trees grow much more slowly and so the fiber is much more compact. The ring structure is much tighter. According to American scientists, the climate in the 17th and 18th centuries is perhaps responsible for the inadvertent success of the violin maker. At the time, Europe went through a minor ice age. Trees used by Stradivari would have been subjected to long periods of winter cold. So, the growth rings would develop very tightly, resulting in a very dense wood with unmatched sound quality. Even if this argument carries a certain weight, it goes only so far, for the other craftsmen of the time work with the same wood, from the same trees, but without the same success. Anche già abbastanza leggero, eh? Sì, è come già, suona, sentiamo già, un po' qua. Gli anni di stagionatura. Another theory seems more plausible, according to which the quality of the Stradivarius violins is a result of the drying time of the wood. The defenders of this explanation think that the violin maker worked only with very dry wood. It's even thought that he bought a stock of wood from his former master when he retired. Scientists have tried to put this theory to the test. Dendrochronology allows us to date the trees used by instrument makers. This science is based on the study of growth rings whose width varies from one year to the next according to climatic conditions. The measurements taken from the top plates of each violin are compared to reference curves to give us not only the date each tree was cut down but also which stand of trees it came from. But how can we find out how long the wood dried? 50, 60, 70 years, like some people claim? It's Antonio Stradivari himself who provides us with the answer, for he would always glue a label inside the body of his violins with the date the instrument had been made. Taking the difference between the age of the tree and this date, scientists can figure out how long the wood dried. As far as the drying time of Stradivarius violins go, well, the studies carried out recently in England and Germany tend to give a shorter drying time than what we always thought. So not 60 or 70 years, but rather 20 years or even less. The theories that have been advanced about long-term drying techniques should clearly be revised. The violin maker's art is to be found elsewhere. The quality of the wood, the drying, the composition of the varnish, the climate, none of these explain the value of a Stradivarius. Should we investigate the history of violin making and imagine that perhaps Antonio Stradivari was the last guardian of a secret skill that has since disappeared? Well, 
Et quand tu coupes, tu te toi, le tiens, tu le tiens. Pour la vie, la vie, la vie. La chance de Stradivarius. Stradivarius was very lucky to have as his master Andrea Amati, who was a real perfectionist. And when you see the pieces that he turned out, they're already instruments of great finesse, great mastery. So when Stradivarius started working on his own, he designed a violin that was maybe a bit more stocky, a bit more virile with shorter corners, a bit more robust, with a thicker head, but still was a very fine-looking instrument with a lot of finesse. And so he showed the way to modern violin making. The secret is an assiduous activity at the beginning. You have to be totally immersed. You can't hold back. I used to have an uncle who was a painter. When I was very young, he told me that to make a good painter, you have to sleep in your studio when you start out. Soak up the smell of turpentine. Get your hands dirty with paint. Have it under your skin all day long. You have to relish the feel of your fingers in the wood shavings. You should be polishing your hand with the wood as much as the wood with your hand. You know, Stradivarius was just this chunky fellow who spoke with a thick peasant accent because Cremona was a bit like the Berry region in France, just as rustic, and they have a heavy accent too. So if you just picture this stout man with his rustic accent, that shoots holes in the idea of mystery. There's no mystery, there's mastery. It's much more beautiful. For violin makers, the quality of Stradivari's violins was born from his insatiable curiosity, from the scope of his research, from his rare mastery of the workmanship. According to them, the subtle harmony of his instruments is a result of his excellent craftsmanship rather than a secret formula. And yet we can still wonder. Because for three centuries now, violin makers have been trying to attain the quality of Stradivarius without ever, according to musicians, succeeding. Perhaps there's some detail that they've overlooked. It's always very amusing to discuss that with colleagues. Recently I was talking with a very good violin maker, and it was so typical. He said to me, you know the way the layers are spread over the plates doesn't affect the sound, because on a Stradivarius, it's not at all even. In one spot it's thinner, another it's thicker. And I answered, on the contrary, the application is very important. It's precisely because it's asymmetric that it sounds so good. We often think like him that perfection is the right path, whereas this perfection is disastrous for the sound. According to Martin Schleske, these differences in the thickness of the layers would explain the richness of the Stradivarius sonority. And yet, even though all violin makers agree on the elegance of the master's violins, some voice doubts about their supreme tone quality. They even dare whisper in their back shops that they are not really exceptional instruments. Should we believe them?